Deuteronomy chapter 30, beginning in verse 11. Now what I'm commanding you today is not too difficult for you or beyond your reach. It's not up in heaven so that you have to ask, who will ascend into heaven to get it and proclaim it to us so we may obey it? Nor is it beyond the sea so that you have to ask, who will cross the sea to get it and proclaim it to us so that we may obey it? No, the word is very near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart so you may obey it. See, I have set before you today life and prosperity, death and destruction. For I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in His ways, to keep His commands, decrees and laws. Then you will live and increase and the Lord your God will bless you in the land you are entering to possess. But if your heart turns away and you are not obedient, and if you are drawn away to bow down to other gods and worship them, I declare to you this day that you will certainly be destroyed. You will not live long in the land you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. This day I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live and that you may love the Lord your God, listen to His voice and hold fast to Him. For the Lord is your life and He will give you many years in the land He swore to give to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is the word of the Lord for us today. We love either or. We love black and white, one or the other, two options, this or that. It's just much easier that way, isn't it? We aren't, uh, when we aren't given a choice, we fuss about it because we know deep down within us that we were created to be free and we were born with the ability to choose, right? Right? And so when we don't have a choice, we, we fuss about it. And yet when we have too many choices, we can't make up our minds, can we? Because many of them seem to be the same, and it's hard to narrow them down. And so many times if we have too many choices, we just get confused and we get frustrated. And so then we would just assume somebody choose for us. Oh, we're still going to complain about it if they choose for us. But it's just easier to complain than it is to choose. But what we really love is those polar opposites, those kind of choices, on or off, or left or right, or north or south, east or west, those kind of things where it's just easy. That Just two options. But we realize that everything's not so cut and dry, cut and dry is it? Life is not made up of those kind of choices. It's not always so obvious whether we're choosing, as Moses says to us here, life or death, or blessings or curses. Boy, if it was that obvious to us, wouldn't it be so much easier? It's not always obvious to us how the choice that we make is going to affect our lives, or maybe even others' lives on down the road. I was thinking about the choice of one certain young girl that she made to go fill in for her sister at an FFA state convention a few years ago. Because of the choice that her sister made, she couldn't go, so this particular girl went in her sister's place. And because of that choice that she made, well, one certain young man got to meet the love of his life. And he still is reaping the benefits of that today. Oh. See, I got blessings out of her choice that she made many moons ago. We love those black and white choices, but we don't live in a world of black and white, do we? We live in that world of, of gray. But sometimes and oftentimes it's in that world of the gray that we learn to trust and we learn to obey. 
We learn to look to the Lord. You know, I believe that we like it. Uh, we like having order in our lives. Believe that or not, we like having order. We like being uh, having a schedule and having a, a certain plan and a path. And we operate best when we have structure. People like to argue that fact, but but God knows this about us and that's how he he created us in this manner and yet within that sense of order and structure he gave us the 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 ability to choose he gave us creativity and he gave us freedom for decisions for choices that's why for Adam and Eve I believe they were given the choice they were given that ability that Moses talks about here to choose life or death, blessings, or curses. They had that choice to eat of anything at all in the garden except for one. One tree, they were told, do not eat from this tree. But it, what it boils down to for Adam and Eve here in the garden is that they were given the choice whether or not to obey God. They could choose to obey Him or not, and, and they could trust that God had their very best interest at heart when He told them not to eat from this tree, or they could chance it, they could risk it, and they could find out for themselves what they thought was best for them. You know, it's very telling that the serpent, as he approached them, he knew how to play on their emotions, didn't he? And, and it says, when, when Eve saw that fruit, and it says the tree was good for food, and it was pleasing to the eye, and desirable for gaining wisdom, that's when she reached out and she took and she ate and she gave it to her husband. But did you hear those descriptive words? And what played on her mind, and played on her emotions, and played on her stomach? The choice that she had was to obey God who had already given all that they needed, all the food that they could ever want, all the beauty of creation to fill their eyes, all the wisdom that they needed to live and to commune with God. Or they could choose to go against what God said, choose to be deceived by their eyes, to be deceived by their stomachs, and be deceived by their minds. And isn't it funny how when we're tempted, those are the things that we're tempted by. Those things that we're tempted by, those things that we know are wrong, they just look so appealing, don't they? They look so good, or they taste so good, or they get into their minds so that we just possi can't possibly uh, live without it, or that's what we think anyway. That's how the tempting turns into reality. And they're so easy to justify. It may be a choice of trying something just one time. Whether it's that drink or that smoke or in my case, that one little pinch of tobacco as a teenager. Just to be like everybody else. Had to try it. But that one little pinch led to over 20 years of addiction but thank the Lord by His grace, for 11 months now, Friday, if you want to know 11 months now and two days and, and 21 hours, and, and I've been free from that. The Lord has set me free. <laughs> Not that I wouldn't take another one right now this very minute, I'm telling you. Because that's the grip that sin gets a hold of you. And when sin takes root in your life, it doesn't want to let go. Do you see? It just takes one little time, one little instance. That's the way sin works. It's pleasing to the eye, pleasing to the stomach, pleasing to the mind. And then once it gets root, it doesn't let go. One little time. Now, I don't know. I know the long-term effect it had on my finances. 
how it affected that. I know it, it was a, a bad example for my children. I don't, still don't know the long-term effect it had on my health. So far, I'm fine, but that's yet to be told, right? But that one little choice, that one little sin creeps in and it takes root and it doesn't let go. I don't know, maybe our problem is, maybe our true problem comes from our fear of trusting God. Because we can't see what God has promised and so we're so scared to do what He's asked us to do. The easy road is to give in to those temptations and those fears. The hard road is the road to trust and the, trust and, and the road to obedience. That's the hard choice to make. Abraham was given a choice. Abraham chose the hard road. God said, Abraham, I'm calling you to, to go from your family and to, to go to a land I'm going to show you. And Abraham did. He chose to trust God. Now, he had a hard time at times, and he waffled in his faith, had a hard time trusting that God was going to come through on that promise of a son. Of a son. And so he took matters in his own hands a few times along the way. But God did come through, didn't he? God came through. He always comes through in his time. Not our time, but his time. And you see, Abraham, Abraham had his family grow. Just as God promised it would, he grew into a great nation. And somehow through complacency or I don't know what, that great nation ended up in the bondage of slavery in another nation, in Egypt. And God, once again, He heard their cries and He came to their aid. And He promised that He would, uh, that he would free them and He would take them to the land that He promised to their forefathers. But once again, they had trouble trusting and obeying God. And out of their tra uh, travels out of Egypt, they had trouble seeing past all of these objects that were in the way, didn't they? They first couldn't see past Pharaoh and the grip that he had over them. But God had a plan for that. Then they, they come upon this great sea. And it seems like an immovable barrier, right? But God parted those waters. And then they, they end up in this desert and they can't see past the desert. And they get out in there in the desert and they're a little thirsty and they're a little hungry. And they can't see past that, that, that thirst or that hunger pain. And they grumble and they whine. But God came through every time right on time. He brought forth water out of a rock to give them water. He brought down and He rained down manna and quail from heaven to feed this multitude of people. Each and every time, rather than trusting God though and thanking God for the gifts that He gave them, what did they do? They complained and they moaned and groaned and said, we'd rather be right back there in captivity and in our sin rather than to trust you. But even still, God continued to lead them and He brought them to the, to the border of the promised land and He showed them this is what I've been promising you for this whole time. And he, and he let them see into this land, this land flowing with milk and honey. But instead of completely trusting in God, they had to send in spies to, to see the land themselves, right? And though that they saw that the land was just as God promised it would be, they saw that it was just as good as God said it would, that it was going to be. They still couldn't believe and couldn't bring themselves to trust because they saw these people that occupied the land. And they said, we can't do it. We can't take them. Even though God had said, yes, you can. If you will trust me, if you will obey me, you can do this. They said, no, we can't. We can't trust you. They chose to take their own path. And so by their own choosing, this generation of people got to wander in the desert for 40 years. And this generation of people 
never got to set foot in the land that was promised. It was promised to them, do you understand? They were freed from bondage and were taken to the land and could have taken it, could have entered into the land. And by their own choosing, they stayed out. And during all of that, even Moses, when he was so frustrated at their lack of faith and their lack of belief and trust, at another time when, when he was bringing, uh, when God was providing water for them from yet another rock out here in the middle of the desert, Moses took credit for it. And so even Moses was told, you're not going to enter into the land either. And so here we are now, 40 years later, after being freed from that bondage, having now come and gone with these 40 years, and it's time now to enter into this land that God has promised. And here's Moses giving his final instructions, his goodbye, farewell speech before he dies. Yes, you see, Moses knows that he's about to die. And here he is choose, talking about choosing life. Knowing full well that he's not going to enter in to the promised land. Yet he's telling them and encouraging the people to choose life. Choose to follow God and his ways and his commands. Choose life. For I command you this day to love the Lord your God, to walk in His ways, to keep His commands, His decrees, and His laws. And then you will live and increase in the, in the land that the Lord is going to bless you and in the land that you are going to enter. Because Moses has also seen the other side of this, right? And so he warns them of the consequences. But if your hearts turn away... And if you're not obedient... See, remember, this is a whole new generation of people now, right? The others have all died off. This is a new group entering in. So if your hearts turn away, and if you're not obedient, and if you're drawn away to bow down to other gods and worship them, then I declare to you this day that you will certainly be destroyed. And you won't live long in the land that you're going to enter and possess. And do you understand, folks, that just as Adam and Eve, when God, when God told them and warned them, they didn't immediately drop dead, did they, when they took of that fruit? But they certainly did taste death. Death came into their life. It entered in. And they knew death because that's what God had told them would happen. And Moses' is warning of, of destruction here, you will certainly be destroyed. And that's certainly what happens. And in the end, just as Adam and Eve found death, just as those who ended up here in the desert found, just as those uh, in Israel and Judah later on would discover when they're taken into captivity, it may not be an immediate thing, but it just takes one choice to head down that road to destruction. If that's what you want to choose, if you want to choose to turn away from the Lord, you will find death. You will find destruction. You will find those curses. So this is what Moses sets before them before he dies. Life and prosperity, death and destruction. Life and death, blessings and curses. Joshua takes over for Moses. And he leads them on into the promised land. And after they take possession of the land, and now Joshua's on his desk door, and he reiterates the promise. In Joshua 24, he says, Now you fear the Lord and serve Him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your forefathers worshipped beyond the river in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day who you will serve whether the gods your forefathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. It is a choice that you have to make. It is a choice that is set before you. What will you choose? 
And the people here told Joshua, of course we'll choose to serve the Lord. But Joshua said, folks, it's more than just lip service. You've got to bring more than that to God. More than just offering it with your mouth. You've got to back that up with action. And the Word says that this generation, these folks that promised it, did indeed worship the Lord. But the problem is the next generation grew up and they did not because it says in Judges that the next generation neither knew the Lord or what He had done. So do you know what that means? That this generation that promised this to Joshua did not teach their children to worship the Lord. They didn't teach their children to honor God. They didn't teach their children anything about what God had done among them. Folks, we have a choice to make today. We have a generation of folks growing in America today that neither knows the Lord or knows what He has done among us. Look around this room today. We've got one generation that is well represented among us. Right? But then you see my generation largely absent. And then the next, where are they? If my generation is falling away, then, then we're raising up a whole generation of people that neither knows the Lord or anything about Him. What will we choose? Will we choose to be content to serve the Lord the rest of our days and then let the next generation fend for themselves? Or will we choose to love the Lord and to walk in His ways and to keep His commands? And do you know that part of keeping His commands is to pass it on to our children and to our children's children and to the alien and to the stranger among us so that they know how to love the Lord our God and they know what He has done among us. We've already seen what harm one simple choice can lead to. You see it, you know it in your own life. And we can see it in the life of the country. We can see what the choice of one little sin, how it can take root and take hold, and when it does, it will not let its grip go. James says in, in one five of his book, he says, After desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, it gives birth to death. Sin leads to death and destruction. It leads to curses. But we can choose a different way. We do not have to choose to give in to the ways of this world, to the gods of this world. We do not have to be tolerant of sin in our lives and the lives of others. We can choose life. It is an option on the table. You can choose life. It's not a difficult choice. The commands of God are not far off from you. It's not out of your reach so that you need some great sage or some prophet or some pope or some priest to obtain it for you. You don't need some preacher to grab it for you, to proclaim it before you. It's right there in your very own mouth and in your very own heart that you can obey it. You have the Word of the Lord within you. If you proclaim Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have His Spirit within you so that you have the Word of God within you. It is within you. It is right there accessible to you. You have God among you. So it's not far off that you don't know the Word of God. Christ is all among us. The Holy Spirit lives and moves and works about the whole earth so that no man is without excuse. So what will you choose? This day, heaven and earth stand as witnesses against you that you have been set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live 
and that you may love the Lord your God, that you would listen to His voice, that you would hold fast to Him. For the Lord is your life. Do you understand that? The Lord is your life. Choose to trust in the Lord even when it's hard to do so. And I know sometimes it's hard to do so. The easy road is to give in. Is to give up and to give in. To bow to the pressures of the world, to sin, to destruction. But choose the Lord. He is laid out and He knows what is best for you. He's laid it out in His Word. He's laid it out in your heart. Choose to trust Him. Even when you cannot see, trust Him. What will you choose today? As we sing our closing hymn, some of you may be here today and you need to make that choice for the first time to put your trust in the Lord. You've trusted far too long in yourself. You've trusted in the ways of the world. Choose life. Choose to trust in God. Choose to bow to Him today. Would you come? Would you give your life to the Lord? If you're here and you're struggling and you've, you've, you've come along in this world and you've bowed to the pressures, you've, you've given your heart to God, but it's been so easy to, to just trust in the ways of the world rather than to trust God, come get on your knees before Him today and say, God, I trust you. Help me to trust you. Help me in my unbelief. He's here for you, and He wants to help you. If you'll call on His name, would you do that as we sing today?